Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were running towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Here's the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Don't cling to me. Don't seize me, is the literal meaning of the Greek. And I think, for me, they are possibly some of the cruelest words, I thought, in the New Testament. Some years ago, uh, Bishop Andy of Bangor did a wonderful Lent book uh, looking at various statues. And one he looked at was uh, a statue depicting this very incident. It's in Winchester Cathedral, and it's known by the Latin of the New Testament, Noli me tangere, don't touch me. Not everybody likes the statue. It's angular, not very appealing, not touchy-feely, not romantic. But for me, it captures something about the horror as well as the joy of the resurrection. We're so used to the story as Christians. Yes, Jesus rose again. Uh, we haven't seen people rise since Jesus. But we're used to the story. We're not used to people rising from the dead, but we're used to this story, this Easter story. We go through the discipline of Lent, the sorrow of Holy Week, the anger of Holy Week too, as we see uh, Jesus being betrayed and let down and then handed over for political expediency. Although who can blame the religious leaders in Jerusalem? knowing that every Passover, the Roman troops come in through the one gate into the city, the coast side gate. The legions come in to make sure at Passover there is no trouble. And Roman legions weren't noted for their compassion, gentleness and kindness. So what was on the top of Caiaphas and Annas's thoughts at this time is let there not be a massacre. So we shouldn't rush to blame. But nevertheless, the sorrow of Good Friday, the sorrow that we feel that his first disciples felt, his mother felt, his friends felt, the sadness of his death, the cruelty of his death, and the 
hopes shattered, lying with the body of Jesus in his borrowed tomb. And at the first time she could, Mary goes to do what she wants to do for her Lord, to properly reverence and bury and anoint his body, something that was done in haste uh, on the night of his death. And horror of horrors, this tomb is empty, and she makes the obvious conclusion that the body's been stolen for whatever reason. She rushes back to Peter and the other disciple. They come and the lovely story of Peter not quite being able to keep up with the beloved disciple who gets there first and who sees and believes. And Peter who goes in and wonders. And then they go back home. What more can they do? Mary is not satisfied. She wants to find the body. She stands there weeping, hoping that she might some, find someone who can help. She turns around and there's a man there. And this is the lovely bit in the story. It's confusing in both ways. Um, she doesn't recognise Jesus. How could you not recognise the one you were looking for? The fact that she wasn't expecting to see him alive is some sort of excuse, but still, how would you not recognise Jesus? But also, she doesn't take him for anything other than a normal, real, living, breathing, pre-death human being. She takes him to be the gardener. The story is so unlikely that we have to accept it's the story that she told. I turned round and there, there, there was this man standing there. I thought, I thought he was the gardener. And I ask him, if, if you know where they've taken him, please tell me because I will go. I will go and get him. I will go and see to him. I, I just have this that I want to do. I want to say goodbye. I want to. Jesus doesn't answer her with explanations. She's turned around again by this point and he says her name and there's something about his voice. She turns around and she looks and she sees and the next words is, Jesus, don't cling to me, don't seize me. And so we assume that what goes on in the intervening seconds is Mary putting her arms to him. Don't touch me. And again, I haven't yet ascended to the Father, that this makes no sense. And therefore, possibly it is what she remembered what he said to her, why would you not remember? Why would not those words be burned in your mind and in your heart? He told me not to touch him. And that is what the resurrection is. It is joy and sorrow intermingled. It doesn't end the sorrow of Good Friday. Jesus died on the cross and was buried and his body was laid into the tomb. And when he rose again and met Mary, the disciples in the upper room, the disciples on the Emmaus road and at the breaking of the bread, the disciples in Galilee cooked them breakfast, none of that was quite as it was. This is not the happy ending to the sad story of Holy Week, the crucifixion and the burying of Jesus. This is the beginning of an entirely new beginning, not just for Jesus, but for the world. Death, the church proclaims, has been conquered. There are some wonderful, wonderful prayers that the Orthodox have about the harrowing of hell. And they put into the words of death that shock horror. Oh, great, I thought I'd captured another victim, but oh! He not only is one I am not allowed to hold, but through him all are rescued. Death is broken, which doesn't mean to say that on this side of it, as human beings, we do not mourn. And how many are mourning at this dreadful time? There are people who are losing their loved ones to, when I say ordinary, ones that were expected, or shocks that, although unexpected, are not outside of what normally happens. But there are others who are losing loved ones to the coronavirus. Some of them who are 
people like myself who might, I'm not ill, but might just get ill, others who are people who have the virus because they are putting themselves in harm's way, because they are looking after those of our loved ones who are suffering and ill. Looking after people so that they recover while some of our health workers, our care workers, do not. And in London, bus drivers. So at this time, let's say a huge thank you to all those who are putting their lives on the line uh, for the sake of the rest of us. Let us pray for them and be grateful to them. And for us, let's do what we can. If we are not one of those people, not one of those key workers, let's make sure we obey the rules and restrictions which aren't there to make our lives bad. They are there to protect us, to protect our health, and even more so to protect the capacity of our NHS to cope with what may be coming. And at this time, we need to hear that as horrible as death remains, it is something we can look in the face. Not meaning that we do not take it seriously or try and avoid it and ameliorate it and do all that we can uh, to cope in this crisis uh, to bring us through. But it means as Christians, when we finally have to make that last journey, as we all will, it's coronavirus or something later, we can look into the eyes of our Lord and Saviour and say, here am I, Lord, hold me. Because we know that Jesus has walked that way before us and that Jesus has broken death, has been raised to new life and that the grave has become for us a bed of hope. So on this Easter morning, in this strangest of strange times, I proclaim to you, Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And may his blessing be upon you today and every day. Amen. <laughs>